Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of the Bitcoin Report. Uh, this week, we have a guest, and his name is Eric Forres. Maybe you know him. Hello. Um, <laughs> and he is uh, the CEO of Shapeshift.io, and that's an it's a, it's an exchange, but not like like an ordinary exchange. It's much simpler. So you 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 can put uh, some cryptocurrency into the, their system, and you can get another cryptocurrency out of it. I, I, do I explain it? Uh, yeah, that's good? it. Is it yeah, yeah. It's, it's simple like that. It's uh, it's kind of like a vending machine. You, you you just walk up and you put some coins in, and out comes a candy bar. Um, but instead of candy bar, it's other other kinds of cryptocurrency. Yeah, the, the idea for that uh, for that for that service. It was a long time ago that you were uh, you that you start to think about it. Um, it was like a couple weeks after I left Coinapult, which was the company yeah. I was with uh, in 2013, um, and I thought I, I wanted to buy some some altcoin. I don't even remember what it was, but I I just wanted to gamble on it basically and get some $500 worth or whatever. And uh, I realized it was going to take all afternoon because I was going to have to sign up with an account and an exchange and deposit money and wait for all the confirmations and then put in a bid order and wait for it to fill and withdraw, which can take up to a day sometimes from some of these exchanges. And um, just became quite a quite a task to get some coins. And I and I thought this is ridiculous. In in the cryptocurrency world, I should be able to snap my fingers and change any coin into any other coin. Uh, as easily as, as sending an email, so that's what I went to um, to go about building. Yeah, and I, can you explain how the pro the process works to our uh, uh, viewers? So, uh, what steps they uh, they are gonna t have to take to to mm -hmm. uh, to trade their uh, their cryptos? So, uh, let's say you have a Bitcoin and you really like the whole Ethereum concept, so you want to buy some Ether. Um, you come to Shapeshift.io. You don't have to sign up for an account or anything like that. You just uh, select, you know, that you have Bitcoin and that you want Ethereum. And then you put in your Ethereum address and you click start. And then uh, Shapeshift gives you a Bitcoin deposit address and you send your Bitcoin to that address. And then we we shoot Ethereum out at you. And uh, that's it. it. So the whole thing can really be done in 30 seconds. And um, it's fully available via API. So other websites and bots can can use it to acquire uh, assets easily so um, it's it's really built to be very a very simple way to change any digital asset into any other digital asset yeah and and what 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 transfer rates do they uh, do you charge for so it? the the rates always change so all these coins are traded at various um, traditional order book exchanges that's how these prices get discovered so shapeshift is always watching the prices of all these coins at every exchange that we plug into, which is five or six. And um, based on whatever lowest rate we see out in the marketplace, we take that, we consider <laughs> variables like uh, the spread, the volatility, and then we add a margin, which is, becomes our profit. And so uh, the exchange rate that the user sees uh, is, the exact, is the exact rate that they get, um, which includes uh, the revenue for Shapeshift. Yeah, is it is it an average of, of multiple exchanges, or are you you using one exchange? Well, the lowest. So, so if we see five exchanges that are selling Bitcoin and Litecoin, um, the price at all those exchanges will be in a range. So we have a range of prices. Shapeshift takes the bottom one, and then based on a number of variables, adds some amount of margin to it. Uh, so the price that you get at Shapeshift for a, a liquid uh, market like Bitcoin to Litecoin should roughly be an average of the the best rates out there and the worst rates out there, something sort of in the middle. So, but uh, much faster and much safer because people don't have to store money at the exchange and and hold it there. So, um, it's it's meant to make things very easy. And I, I think you know w one of the big tasks for any Bitcoin company is to make these services really easy for people to use. And it's been a long process. Um, and it, it'll continue to do that until the stuff becomes commonplace. Yeah, because I, I think this uh, uh, shape shift is more for mainstream mainstream buyers than uh, day traders and, and and professional sellers. Because, yeah. Yeah. It, you, can you do do day trading with it? You can. Uh, it has an API, so you can write bots mm -hmm. that, that use it as a market. So uh, there are people who who, who watch shape shift as a marketplace. <clears throat> will sometimes do arbitrage between different things. 
Um, but in general, since Shapeshift doesn't have limit orders, only market orders, basically, we tell you the price that we can sell it to you at this moment. Um, since we don't have limit orders, um, normal day traders don't use it so much. Um, but uh, we figured out how to do limit orders, so can't talk too much about that yet. But um, suffice to say, in 2016, uh, Shapeshift will be a pretty exciting place. And what what will Shapeshift do in 2016? Are they rolling out more services? Because we we already really see the API use in, in different websites, um, it, uh, altcoin websites, and where you can 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 uh, shift the coin from that page itself. Yep. Um, can you can you lift the curtain a bit about uh, <laughs> what what's in store in 2016, or yeah. is it all classified? Uh, it's not all classified. Um, so from from what people will be able to see. Uh, we have a, a CoinCap uh, mobile app coming out. CoinCap is .io is our, our sort of sister site that we built to show pricing um, in real time for all digital assets. And uh, we're building a really cool mobile app for that for iPhone right now. Um, we also have a new website coming out for Shapeshift, which we when we started Shapeshift, it was just uh, just Bitcoin and Litecoin. That, that was the one pair that people could trade. It was no no advanced features or anything. And so we've over the last year and a half, kept adding features and, and adding things to that design. And it's gotten to the point where I think it's now kind of confusing to a new person. So uh, with knowing all that we've learned, we are redoing the whole website to, to be streamlined and very simple again. So that's, that's coming soon. Um, and then as I, as I alluded to, we'll have um, limit orders available. Uh, so that will mean that people can do, you know, normal professional trading at Shapeshift and um, beyond that, uh, I think the other things I'll keep secret for now, but uh, we, we're always trying to, to build bigger and better. And, yeah. and I guess, you know, in the, in the back end, there's a lot of work we always are trying to do to get our pricing better. So, um, you know, trying to, to build algorithms to handle that more safely. It's a very difficult problem in the, in the crypto markets because these markets are not liquid. A $500 order can move the price of some of these coins by five or ten percent and so it's really hard to price some of this stuff um, that problem will tend to go away over time as these markets mature but we're also trying to get better at, at it ourselves yeah how do, how do, how do you pick the, the coins that you are you have on the site because it's a uh, it's not all all alt, alt coins are you looking to uh, to coins that have a, a shady uh, is shady uh, creators or uh, how do you <laughs> well there are enough coins to have that of course <laughs> yeah one uh one rule of the altcoin world is that every coin has people calling it a scam and that, that's true even for bitcoin of course the, much, <clears throat> of the, much of the world still thinks bitcoin itself is a scam and some of these coins are scams uh we we try to avoid those but generally we just add coins that people are trading actively so if you go to coincap.io you see a they're, they're ranked by um the market cap of these coins and generally the coins that have a high market cap and a high trading volume and the trading volume is actually more important are the ones that we want to add some of the coins are very easy to add because they are essentially clones or forks of bitcoin um, and some are very difficult because they're entirely different code bases like ripple so um, if something is is difficult to add and low on that list it's unlikely we'll add it if it's easy to add and uh, high high volume, then then we'll probably add it. But we've added, you know, I think we're at about forty two coins or something, and and we have most of the popular ones. So um, our work right now is not in just continuing to add coins that people don't really care about that much, but in really improving the core service for those coins that people are trading actively. Yeah. Do you, Do you have a favorite altcoin? The only other altcoin I own. I own a little bit of NXT and I own some uh, some Ethereum. Um, other than that, I pretty much just assume that that by owning and running Shapeshift, I I have essentially a stake in the entire industry of yeah, of, course. of yeah. non Bitcoin assets. So that that's pretty much my my position on it. Yeah, um, my idea was because Shapeshift exists. I thought, well, uh, the mo uh, many people are are. Uh, are running out of the altcoin uh, community uh, myself also i got burned a lot with uh, with uh, with investing in altcoins and my problem was i i really believed in some coins yeah 
Uh, and that yeah. was the problem because I, be I believed in the, in the people behind it. Uh, but yeah, the, the, because the, the people, uh, the, the, the traders, uh, it's, it's such a, a mess in, in, that, uh, in, the, in the, that area. Um, if, if the market cap uh, goes high, uh, people uh, uh, let, let it drop. So I, uh -huh. I, I'm out. So <laughs> can, can you imagine it? Yeah, there, there are uh, a lot of people get burned with this stuff. Um, I think it's important to understand that most of these altcoins will not exist. Like it's a, a very um, high turnover industry. Everyone's experimenting with this stuff. A lot of coins will try out interesting things and, and fail, or they'll do something that's not really interesting or useful and they'll fail. Um, and so most coins, pe people, even those who are interested in the altcoin world should assume will fail. Um, but there will be a number of, I think, sort of celebrity coins that, that end up rising through the ranks, having staying power. And, and in general, it'll be the coins that do something unique and useful that Bitcoin doesn't quite do. So Bitcoin's really good for a lot of purposes in a lot of ways, um, but it can't do everything for everyone. And so any, any coin or, or asset that provides a unique and useful service has some, some economic value. And those are the ones which, um, which tend to survive. And some of those might get quite big. Yeah, um, I, I thought uh, I thought uh, Bitcoin can 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 upgrade the, the software. So uh, most uh, features other coins have can be implemented in Bitcoin. Uh, so I That's, thought it's true. Is it it's true? true? Is, um, to, it's it's partly true. Um, it's true in that Bitcoin is always evolving. It's open source software. So in theory, you can add uh, lots of new features to it if they prove useful in other coins um it's not true though that that's either easy or that it will always be done or that um a feature will necessarily be wanted by everyone so uh as an easy example take a coin like new bits or or tether or BitUSD. those three coins are all pegged to the value of one dollar and they do it in different ways but they all do a reasonably good job of maintaining a value at a dollar um bitcoin can't do that it, sh it shouldn't do that. It shouldn't try to do that. It is uh, having both of those assets, one that's pegged to a dollar and one that floats freely, both of those things are useful. And so um, you could never, you know, merge new bits feature into Bitcoin. That, that would be silly and pointless and, and destructive. Um, so that's an easy example. You can have other examples like uh, Ethereum, which are built uh, in a totally new and different way in order to enable smart contracts much more easily. Um, can that get incorporated into Bitcoin? Theoretically, and you have you have things like Rootstock, projects like Rootstock trying to do that in Bitcoin. So maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, and, and maybe both will work in different ways and both be useful. Um, so it, it, sh it shouldn't be assumed that anything can just be stuck onto Bitcoin and and because because sometimes if you stick things onto Bitcoin, it might make it worse and it's better as a separate system. Um, so ultimately the market will figure this stuff out. And I, I think I think it's true that there will be a lot of digital assets that do all sorts of interesting things, but there will be not duplicate assets that each do the same thing. So you won't you won't have two coins that do exactly the same thing. One will win out over the other. Yeah, one one uh, uh, thing, uh, altcoins always uh, always saying that they are a, a lot fast, faster than Bitcoin. Well, it's true that some coins can confirm faster. It's not true that that necessarily means they're more secure. Um, but there may be use cases in the world where getting to that first confirmation is really important. And if that's the case, and Bitcoin takes 10 minutes and other coins take less, then there could be an economic use for those coins in those purposes um i i think in general just having a faster block is not enough of a of an additional feature to to make something stand out um i i'm not bullish on litecoin long term i, I think it doesn't do enough unique uh although i think it it's it stays around as a as the best backup to bitcoin essentially because we all know that some terrible tragedy could befall bitcoin some some zero day exploit or something that people overlooked and just falls apart for whatever reason, that's always possible. So the fact that there is a sort of a second place coin that's almost identical is good. It's healthy for the ecosystem for that to be there. And the price of that should be something over zero. Yeah. And, and then a side change, what's your opinion about it to, to speed up transactions? Well, so side chains can do 
all sorts of things. One thing they can do is uh, provide coins that uh, on which speed up transactions. Um, some people sort of see side chains as a way as something that will eliminate altcoins, and I, I think that's a, a misnomer. I th it certainly, even if it's very successful, it won't eliminate altcoins. All it means is altcoins will be built on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, there will be different assets, but they'll all be on the Bitcoin blockchain, and those assets will trade against each other with different prices, just like just like altcoins do. Um, so it'll it'll change the way that altcoins are built, but it doesn't remove the need for different types of assets. And as long as there are different types of assets in the world, you're going to have um, different pricing in those assets. Yeah. All right. Um, about the the big consensus debate. Uh, I both of my uh, my uh, my guests. I I ask about their opinion, opinions about it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there is uh, well, I'm 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 on Reddit a lot. There are, of course there are many different communities, uh, but the the, the last days uh, there is some kind of uh, of a uh, consensus going on. Uh, even Andre Santinopoulos said we are close. Do you think we are close <laughs> to a consensus on on both um, sides? I don't. I don't know. I mean, we're closer than we were a year ago because we've done a lot of debating and I think the positions are closer together than they used to be. Um, you, have the situ you have the situation where a bunch of core devs are very, very hesitant to cause a hard fork, which increases the block size. I'm totally sympathetic to that. I, I understand the concern. I understand the, the risk of making big changes in, in a $6 billion project. Um, if it's done, it needs to be done with extreme caution and prudency. So I, I get it. I, I don't fault them for being careful. And on the other hand, you you have I think the majority of the community who wants a bigger block size and wants it soon, soon being in 2016. Um, and even the people who don't want the hard fork and to increase the block size, it's more that they don't want to do it yet, or or they want to wait and see, or they, they, no one's really saying um, we will never increase the block size. They're just they just want to do it differently, and so there, there's a lot of nuances to the debate, and it makes it very tricky because it's not just two positions. There's there's lots of differences, and even the people who want to increase the block size don't agree on how much and how fast, and it's it's difficult. Um, so it's it's certainly Bitcoin's biggest challenge right now. Um, I think there will be a huge rally if and when consensus is achieved on that. But that consensus may not happen for, for another year. It, it may be a, an issue that the community deals with for years. Um, and it's okay. I mean, it's it's the downside to a decentralized project that there's no you know strong leader to make the decisions. But it's, it's better this, this way. It's better to have slow measured progress, even if it results in lots of uh, arguing with people on the internet than to have... Um, a wise dictator who would who would guide us along the path. So it, the the process just needs to play out. Um, I think all the options, whether blocks get bigger faster or, or remain smaller for a while, they all result in a certain kind of Bitcoin. And a lot of services will be built to augment whatever kind of Bitcoin we have. So a Bitcoin that is very poor for normal day to day transactions will encourage um, businesses built on top of it that may be off chain, which help people do instantaneous quick transactions with Bitcoin. Um, the entrepreneurial industry will will solve whatever problems Bitcoin as a protocol has. So I'm not super worried about it. It's just uh, a difficult struggle to go through for everyone. Yeah, it's yeah, it's uh, it's. I think it's it's a beauty also from from Bitcoin. We are we never used uh, to use a service or something that needs consensus from a big big party. So it's it's very new. Uh, I think it's the beauty of Bitcoin that we that we we have to learn to 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 uh, yeah to fight for for uh, to to come up with with one idea. So I think it's it's quite, yeah the pressure that's that's being pushed on by the community I think that's not a good thing because it, it takes how long it takes I guess yeah yeah <laughs> I you know and I again I'm sympathetic to to all sides um, I think my personal opinion at this point is a a block size increase should probably happen uh, with a hard fork in 2016 um, it can be a small increase just up to two megabytes or up to four or something. 
Uh, I think enough of the community really wants that to happen that it, it kind of needs to, and it should be used to educate uh, and inform the, the discussion thereafter. So if such a hard fork is done and, and the cap raised, we'll get a lot of information, right? If it's a huge, messy fork, tons of drama and controversy and the price goes all over the place because everyone's worried about it, we need, we need to know that. We need to know how damaging and dangerous a hard fork can be. On the other hand, if it happens really smoothly uh, and we don't see a huge drop in, in node count or big complaints from miners, <clears throat> then we know that um, such forks and, and increasing of block sizes are, are less problematic than some have worried. So it, it seems that we need to jump into that pool this year uh, with some size increase because the a huge portion of the community and maybe the majority is not going to be um, happy or content un until we at least try that. Um, so that's, that probably needs to happen. Um, and how and when, I guess, are, are interesting uh, debates to have. But the core, the core team really doesn't seem to want to do a hard fork at all in, in 2016 with, with a block size increase. And they've, they're pretty firm about that. So I don't, I don't know, I don't know what to do about it. Excited times. Exciting times, yeah, and, and ultimately, the, moment. <laughs> yeah, the, ultimately the decentralization of the whole thing is um, both its greatest strength and its curse. Yeah. Uh, if if a huge majority of people really want to increase the block size and only core devs are saying no, there will be a hard fork that's done not by the core devs, by by miners or something, and that could be a lot messier. So yeah, hopefully B the core B devs are thinking of that. BDC China. Um announce they, they they want to hard fork if the consensus is not reached in China. Mm -hmm. What is your opinion about that? I, I don't know. It's a very I, blunt statement from from BTC, yeah. I guess. I think Maybe uh, if they want to force something well, on, the, on the community. Everyone wants to everyone wants to push Bitcoin forward in the way that they think is best, right? And so it's um if you have an opinion, it's good to to try to push it forward, and it's best to talk with other people and get agreement. But it, like, if there's no agreement, then people have to act, uh, and that action can be dangerous, for you know, good or bad. Um, so I I hope that statements like that will help the core devs realize that this isn't just a bunch of uh, people on Reddit being loud and obnoxious. That there are people who have substantial understandings of Bitcoin. Um, and have considerable, you know, business interests in the success of the project, who want to go a certain way. Um, it doesn't mean that they're right, but it means that their opinions should be strongly considered. I think. And about the uh, the ongoing uh, wars. Um, on another subject, I, I I got a question from one of my viewers. Uh, they said, "How does uh, Eric feels about being an early adopter?" If you were you were from uh, how much was the Bitcoin when you started, and did you mine when yourself? I, I, I mined a little bit for fun uh, on a you know I made a, a four GPU computer um, and and mined for several months in 2011. Uh, lost all that trading. So <laughs> yeah. um, the when I when I first learned about Bitcoin, it was early May of 2011. Bitcoin was about five dollars. And by the time I decided to buy some, uh, a few days later, it was eight or nine dollars. So I had wow. I'd lost like half of the ability to buy it that I would have had in just a few days. And so I and I arrived essentially right before the first bubble, up to thirty-one dollars. Um, so I I was baptized sort of in a, a fiery cauldron of volatility. Yeah, we do <laughs> very volatile if you if you look at the price now. So yeah, well and. It's it's so stable now. People don't appreciate it, that Bitcoin only moves usually one to three percent a day, which is pretty average for a, a stock on a stock market. Yeah. Um, even you know big blue chip stocks will move that amount. Um, oil moves more than that many days, so as does gold. Mm -hmm. um, so the the old trope that Bitcoin is this extremely volatile thing is becoming less true. It's it's still volatile. It's still much more volatile than the dollar. Um, but it is earning stability over time, and I, I think a lot of people don't quite appreciate that as much. I mean, the bubble that I that I was in in 2011, there were coins that were $31, and over eight months they fell down to $2. You know, that's like 95% loss in value. Um, 
so it's a, and the, this last bubble from 1100 down to, to 200 you know that's 80 percent drop so the, the gox bubble the gox bubble right, right. so it's um it's normalizing over time and, 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 and what what's contributing to thing. what what do you think is contributing to the stability is it only exchange uh, the number of exchanges or it's it's mostly an increase in the in the breadth and diversity of the uh economy so bitcoin is larger there are more people using it um for more things it is more valuable it's more stable you know any any financial asset that is larger is is as a general rule going to be more stable it's the same principle that like a canoe is is tippier than a, a cruise ship um, it just it takes more energy to move prices when it's a, a big thing that you know that's why the us dollar is so stable because it's one of the biggest uh, most used, most, used, most, yeah. most liquid assets in the world it's not stable because the us government makes currencies stable yeah. it's stable because it's huge um, and as bitcoin grows people should expect that it would achieve uh, stability over time yeah it's not, it's not something that can be programmed or designed it's something that has to be earned over many years in the marketplace yeah um on a, on another subject the the bitcoin left the, the the bit license we are it's it's a while ago oh, that's my so favorite you, subject yes i know i know <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a while ago so uh the dust has settled settled a bit um if you if you if you're watching a retrospect about uh, your decision can you tell me about it if you did you make i think you made you made a good decision but can you explain that yeah uh so the bit license is new york state's uh license that was legislation that was basically formed as the the first let's call it cryptocurrency specific legislation of any state um perhaps of any government in the world i'm not sure uh, but it explicitly describes lots of things that we felt were unethical mainly the the, the compulsion to spy on users to report information about people who are not even accused of crimes um to the government i, I think that pre-crime uh, Pre, pre, yeah, pre-crime. I mean, it, it it completely goes against the foundational legal principle that that someone is um, innocent until proven guilty. You know, not only are these people that we're supposed to spy on not proven guilty, they're not even accused of doing anything wrong. So that's a whole other level. And and to say that uh, to say that businesses should take personal valuable information from those people that's not needed for the operation of the business itself, store that information and then hand it over to other entities to store thereby putting all that valuable information at risk for identity theft and, and compromise which happens all the time is is completely unethical and it's it, it it's understandable in the past when payment methods required you to know who the person was you, you sort of needed to know personal information because the payment methods were so insecure themselves but now that we have a secure payment system in bitcoin there's really no practical need to know who the person is and so to to force that person to reveal their personal valuable information um, is, is outdated and, and unethical and shapeshifts was opposed to it so we we blocked new york um, just before the legislation became law we uh, we wrote up why we think it's wrong uh, we put it up at a site called pleaseprotectconsumers.org and uh, we listed other companies that also dropped new york uh, at that time and so yeah i mean it was it was a difficult decision because new york's a big market but it's also not the whole world uh and it's not going to be the center of finance in the 21st century that's for damn sure um we're, we're very glad that we blocked it um it was the right thing to do I, I encourage other companies in the industry to do so um you know if there's ever a time to like stand on principle th this was a really good time for that and I think a number of other states have seen the response to the bit license and have um, been more cautious about the legislation they're writing. Um, they've, they've realized that in hindsight, very few people think that the bit license was appropriate. So uh, California drafted legislation, which was uh, more reasonable. Uh, either North or South Carolina put out um, uh, some banking policy that was much more reasonable. So. I think uh, New York's bit license will be remembered as a, a terrible example for how to do cryptocurrency regulation. 
and I, I hope it becomes a terrible example for for the rest of the world to avoid. Yeah, I think I think we needed that kind of statement at that time. So maybe it's, it had to happen. Well, someone's got to do it. Yeah, someone's got to do it. <laughs> but you were not alone in it. it were multiple companies. We we were not alone in blocking New York. I think we were by far the most vocal about it. Um, yeah, on purpose, uh, and it's it's good because you have to sign in other states to uh, what's happening. They can, uh, yeah. can uh, investigate. Yeah, I mean, um, legislation doesn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, legislators don't want to look bad. They don't want to look like they're crushing business or or harming people, which is exactly what the bit license does. And so it's important to. I think stand up and convey that to the world because not everyone follows this stuff as much as those of us who are in the industry. And so it's really our job to to show society why something is wrong. Um, so we, we tried to do that in one small way with New York. Do you think they they, they can backtrack from it or? Uh, I don't know. I mean, the, I mean Ben Lasky, the the head guy, just kind of he's gone. He, he <laughs> peaked out. Yeah, he yeah. he like. Conjured up this terrible uh, diktat, threw it out. Burning building, you run away from the building. From yeah, and then the he, he ran away and joined the private sector uh, to get you know consulting gigs. Yeah. So, so yeah, uh, he, he he wrote. Left. I think he wrote what what the government wanted, right? Well, the government <laughs> there's not there's not the government, right? There's there's lots of individual politicians and bureaucrats, many of whom have different goals, different um, ideas about how things should be done. He, I think, wanted to be the pioneer of, I mean, a lot of these politicians think that they foster innovation, like that that innovation comes from the, the writing that they do in their rules. And when they make their wise rules, civilization f flourishes. And, and they believe that that's how the world works. Um, so I think he saw this Bitcoin world as, as an interesting new technology, something with a lot of potential. And he's like, I will be the, the one who, who crafts the, you know, the, um, the fertile soil in which this industry can bloom here in New York. And, and he, he's just, he's so, um, he's so misguided and, and so much hubris and just the thought that he should be permitted, you know, this unelected guy should be permitted to dictate not only what people do in New York, but in the whole country of the U.S., and not only the whole country of the U.S., but the entire world, because Shapeshift is a Swiss company. Why did we have to block New York, right? We're not a New York company. We're not even a U.S. company. But if you have one customer somewhere, uh, these regulators will often claim jurisdiction over you. So so Ben Lasky's pen uh, has, has dictated how businesses all over the world can can interact with their customers. And if you think about it, so like in Shapeshift's model, we don't require users to sign up or anything. Um, if we decided to, to stay operating in New York, we would have to get all that information, uh, which means that we have to get that information on everyone, right? Because if we don't get the information on some internet visitor, we don't know if that person's in New York or not. So that means we are imposing New York's policies on a customer from the Netherlands or from China or from Australia. Uh, no, no legislation should have arms that reach that long. It's just a, a recipe for widespread harm, and and I think it's it's symptomatic of um, government growing without bound and and without you know without prudence. Yeah, um, did, did know your customer um, that, that that you know uh, who is who is buying or or, or transferring. Uh, Bitcoin or altcoins. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have we have a, a, a Bitcoin provider, and he has uh, yeah he has know your customer uh, in place because yeah they, they can buy Bitcoin at, at them, so they want to know uh, if if they're not uh, uh, yeah well how do you call it uh, money laundering, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, is is that another problem with, uh, with your service that you that maybe people are use it for the wrong reasons because you don't have uh, KYC. Uh, any useful tool or service will sometimes be used for bad things, right? That's to not to not accept that and to know that that's true is to have your head in the sand. Um, Shapeshift specifically, uh, I think, has innovated in a really interesting way, which is that uh, so regulators typically have two main 
things that they want to ensure, which guides their, their regulation in this financial world. Uh, one is the uh, money laundering aspect, and one is the consumer protection aspect. So Shapeshift meets those objectives, I think, in a very elegant way. It meets the money laundering aspect um, because every transaction through Shapeshift is public. It's shown on the front page of the site. Uh, the coin that comes in, the amount that, of the coin that comes in, and, and the coin that goes out. So anyone with cursory knowledge of blockchains can can watch those and know that anything that goes in and, and where it goes and follow the blockchain that way. So in the, in a sense, we are the most transparent exchange in the entire world, um, not just in the cryptocurrency world, but in all of finance, right? Show, show me an exchange somewhere where every trade is made public so that the investigators don't even need to get a warrant. They can just see the flow going through it. Like we, we are the most transparent exchange of all time. I, I will make that claim. Um, so if they really care about transparency and following the money trail, they can do that more easily on Shapeshift than any other exchange. And on the, uh, on the consumer protection angle, we built an exchange that doesn't require customer deposits, which, which again is uh, you know, unique in the world. Um, so we've, we've built to, to meet the goals of regulators through technology uh, as opposed to following rules written by politicians that really don't understand this stuff in the first place. So that, that's sort of our, our um, one, yeah. mode of operation. Yeah that's, yeah, that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. Well, in, uh, yeah, in, in talking about that, um, I was thinking what, what actions could the Bitcoin community do to uh, encourage more investments in, 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 in Bitcoin and, and yeah, in, in crypto? Because uh, a lot of VC money is, is drying up. Do you, have, do you have the feeling that that, that is true? Or um, other... I think people don't appreciate volatility or variance enough. Um, so we have lots of VCs investing in lots of Bitcoin companies, uh, but there's variance in that. Like these these deals are hard to put together; they take time. So you'll get you'll get bursts. You know, you'll get a point uh, six months or a year where it seems like tons of money is flowing in, and then six months or a year where where nothing flows in. And that doesn't mean that that the uh, economy or interest is slowing down. It's just it's just variance of these deals, um, totally normal. So I, I think that's largely there. Uh, a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of who are considered the most sophisticated financial people in the world, these VCs who, who allocate capital wisely, according to their websites, they tend to be most interested in industries when they're going through their bubble phases. Like, like all people, like the average guy on the street is also most interested in Bitcoin when it hits the $1,000 headline. So the, the investment interest, both from the guy on the street and from the VC, is going to, to follow the, the price movements. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a coincidence that we saw the most amount of you know, VC uh, money happen on the backside of the big bubble. Because that's when VCs wake up and they say, okay, we need to go make a move and those deals take months to put together. Um, when the next bubble happens, whenever that is, you'll get a whole new wave of this stuff. Uh, and it's it's natural and it's it's fine and people just need to understand that that's how it works. And we are expecting a lot of bubbles in 2016, I guess. <laughs> But yeah. after every, every bubble, uh, I think we have, uh, we, we reach new highs with, with, with the price. Uh, that's my opinion. Um, because it's, well, getting, yeah. We, we, we should hit new highs with each bubble if the system's growing, which it is. Uh, I think it's hard to find a metric showing that Bitcoin is, is shrinking or stagnant. Um, so ultimately what justifies any price of Bitcoin is the, the use of it, not just for spending, but for holding money, for doing interesting things like titling records and, and what, all the various things that blockchains are gonna be doing. That usage is what ultimately justifies the price, but the price doesn't move in a perfect relationship to actual usage, it moves in these big speculative bubbles. Um, and you know, I've, I've been through three or four of them now and they're, uh, they're difficult, but that's just part of the industry. And it's good for PR. Bubbles are good for PR and for making people aware that, that Bitcoin yeah. is here to stay. Yeah, I mean, it's, and it's easy to dismiss Bitcoin after the first bubble. So like in 2011, that, that was really the first, the first bubble and lots of people All declared it dead. Yeah. Right, because you know scams or Ponzi schemes will often have a bubble, uh, and then they go away. One bubble, yeah. 
Right. So <laughs> after after one bubble pops, I can understand someone, you know, making fun of Bitcoin yeah. and saying that it's dying. But after three or four bubbles, you have to start realizing that it's it's not just a fad. It is going through cycles of speculative investment, um, and it deserves a little more respect than people gave it originally. Um, is Bitcoin being used in Panama, where you live? Uh, I don't live in Panama anymore. Oh, well, that's, that's a misunderstanding. <laughs> yeah, so I'm in I'm in Denver, in okay. uh, Colorado. Um, so I've been here for CIA, a while. Uh, are you at the CIA? The CIA headquarters? Yeah. Yeah, they they have a, a suite for me, <laughs> a beautiful uh, pen, penthouse suite at the CIA headquarters. Yeah, with lots so of cameras. I, I help them spy on um, you know innocent people around the world. So yeah, they they're, they're, get bigger gotta, paychecks. We got a scoop in here. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you uh, very much for for being at our show. Um, I think uh, people uh, have learned a lot about uh, about shapeshift and about uh, your opinions uh, on the on the bitcoin uh, community and uh, where it's going i look forward to uh, meeting you in in the new year and, and yeah. thanks for uh, thanks so much for the interview well happy bitcoin new year and um, we, we 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 speak uh, uh, in the next year uh, and uh, i want you to, to thank my my viewers to uh, for uh, for watching the show and i see you next week on a new episode of the bitcoin report have a thanks, great Dennis. Day.